The following is a production of New Mexico State University. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Kind of settle into your favorite chair with your colleagues. Ann, would you, Ann, would you, would you tell uh, Senator Domenici that we're ready to go, please? Well, are you, you're wide awake after that session this morning. I thought those two outstanding sessions, and uh, we could talk about health care and border issues probably till the cows come home, as they say. Uh, but I thought both very insightful, very insightful commentary. He'll be here in just a moment. I better wait just a moment then for uh, Senator Domenici. I want to remind you all that later on this afternoon, uh, we're going to have David Walker just walked in, and I do want you to make sure. He, uh, that you hear uh, David Walker and Dr. Marin. This afternoon's sessions have a lot to do with the national debt entitlement programs and how do we afford all this kind of stuff. And uh, this is David right here. And uh, he's, these two people are two of the, this country's leading experts on this particular issue. So I want you all to be sure you're here. We have another special guest coming in, former Congresswoman Heather Wilson is just walking in. She can wave, wave at us from here, from Albuquerque. And she'll be on the program this evening while we have a casual conversation with the Congresswoman and the Senator regarding the future of our country. Okay, at this time I'd like to introduce, a, as they always say, a person who needs no introduction, certainly not around here. Uh, after I came to New Mexico State University again in about uh, 2003, uh, we had, uh, I, I was here three days and the president quit. I don't know whether it's because I came or what happened, but he went on to the University of Houston and so there was a search, a national search, and we found an excellent president of New Mexico State University, Dr. Michael Martin. Happens to be from the same discipline I'm in. We're, we're trained economists, which means we guess a lot and pontificate even more. But he came here and led this uh, great university for four years and brought just a new vision and a new enthusiasm for New Mexico State University. I think one of the top cheerleaders for New Mexico State University who, who reminded us endlessly that we ought to be a whole lot prouder of ourselves than we are, that we had a great university and we ought, to, we ought to work on our esteem a little bit. And I think he certainly did that. Plus, he's a visionary. He had a, a number of visions about how this university should progress and did a marvelous job. Well, just about the time you get used to a fellow and he's just doing really well, someone else comes along and decides they have even a better job for him. So he went to the swamp in Louisiana. And uh, I think now he fishes most of the time in Louisiana. I have no idea what he does. But he went to school uh, in large part, according to his testimony to me, because the gentleman who's the president of that system is a longtime friend of his, had worked for him in the past. And he told me once, the only person I would ever work for again, and I remember his name is John Lombardi, Lombardi John Lombardi. And uh, Lombardi beckoned once, once again, and so Dr. Mike Martin adjourned from New Mexico State University and is now the chancellor of Louisiana State University. I think what he enjoys most about it is he has a nationally ranked football team. Uh, <laughs> Uh, here, here he was able to achieve that, but not, not that he didn't try. Would you please welcome back a longtime friend and a great leader in New Mexico State University, Dr. Michael Martin. Thanks, Gary. It's a delight to be back. And I would also mention we're the national champions in baseball this year as well. We're going to 
where we're going to be at the White on September 30th. We'll be at the White House, and that'll be fun to uh, to celebrate that. Well, it's wonderful to be back at NMSU, and I'm really proud and honored to be here for three reasons. One is I do enjoy coming back and visiting this wonderful campus and a lot of great friends, both on the campus and in the community. The second is that uh, this conference is the product of some sort of uh, you might call it aimlessly uh, imagining taking place uh, several years ago. Gary uh, Carruthers, uh, Ricardo Rell and I were on the phone with Senator Domenici when we hatched the idea of the Domenici Project, which is really threefold. To have the Domenici papers here available for scholars uh, forever to learn about a great 36-year career in Congress and the Senate. Uh, the Domenici Institute to be a think tank for public policy which I fundamentally believed this state needed and the right opportunity came along and to launch the Domenici Conference. And I will tell you, given the way it started, it's really remarkable what this turned into. I congratulate Gary and everyone else who's been involved from turning what was sort of a half-baked notion into a genuinely outstanding opportunity to have some important conversations around the continually emerging legacy of Pete Domenici and his service to the nation and the state. So it's, uh, that's another reason. And third, I'm really delighted to be able to introduce a speaker who I've come to know in the year plus I've been at Louisiana, a member of a, a sort of maybe the first family of Louisiana public service and, and politics. Uh, Senator Mary Landrieu, as you probably know, is I think one year into her third term in the U.S. Senate, having been elected in 1996. She was elected to the state uh, House of Representatives, age 23, a fresh graduate from Louisiana State University, and uh, went on to, uh, as you know, a, a career of great public service. She serves on the Appropriations Committee. She's been very involved with the Homeland Security Subcommittee on Disaster uh, Recovery partly because of Katrina, but partly because that's a lesson well learned. She's been involved and chairs the Small Business Committee. She's on the Energy Committee. Uh, so her service in the Senate is uh, certainly among the very uh, most productive and most uh, visible of the people that serve in that body. But for those of us in Louisiana, and particularly those of us who are uh, sort of dilettante scholars of the Senate and American politics, I've come to appreciate Senator Landrieu for another reason, and that is she is consistently viewed and ranked for her capacity to reach across the aisle, to solve real problems in a nonpartisan way, and to serve the people rather than to serve the politics of the moment. And uh, if there's been a time in this country's history, for those of us who are also dilettante historians, that we need that kind of leadership, this is exactly that moment. And the very fact that uh, Mary's office is in the office that was occupied for many years by Senator Domenici, which makes it a lot easier for me to find when I'm in the Hart Building, <laughs> since I was there many times. That says something as well, that two people from different political parties and perhaps even to some extent different ideologies can both be friends, colleagues, and ultimately policymakers in the very best way. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce an LSU graduate, a long time, though young public servant, the senior senator from Louisiana, Senator Mary Landrieu. Thank you so much, Chancellor, and it really is a, a pleasure uh, to be with you all, uh, even though it's going to be just a brief visit today. Uh, and I wouldn't have missed it. I saw my good friend uh, John Hummer when he greeted me at the door, and he said, I can't believe you're here. I said, John, a hundred wild horses couldn't have kept me in Washington on the day Pete Domenici asked me to be in New Mexico, so I'm here. And I mean that. I was so honored when Senator Domenici called um, to ask me to come and be a part of what I think is going to be a magnificent and hope will be a magnificent gathering uh, for many, many years in our country and, and a gathering that I know that this university is committed to sponsoring uh, that will have really lasting impact in our country and nationally and based on the career of a man that all of you are here because you know and you admire, and I'll come back to that in just a minute, but I, I want to thank uh, our Chancellor, too, 
Um, you know, the senator will, Senator Domenici will know that in our work we move so fast in 10 and 15 minute slots every day, 24 7. Not that we're the only busy people in the world, but it's an amazing job where you have to move from one subject to another. So I saw the uh, chancellor's name and I'm thinking, okay, now why is the chancellor, in my chancellor, I said, introducing me in New Mexico, only to be reminded that this is his home where he was from before he came to us. Having made that, made that connection, I can only tell you um, uh, we are thrilled to have him, and I know it's uh, that you all are sorry to see him go. He's done a wonderful job uh, for us, and we'll be together at the White House celebrating LSU's uh, number one uh, champions uh, at the White House in just uh, just a few days. So thank you, Mike, for the leadership and for what you did here in this university and, and the continuing work that perhaps our universities, you know, can, uh, can do together. And I'll be looking forward to those opportunities to work with your senators. And for your two senators now, Senator Udall and, and Senator Bingaman, I just want to say they're a great team to work with. And um, I'm developing as hopefully as close a relationship um, with the new senator as I have with, um, with Senator um, uh, Domenici. And of course, Senator Bingaman has been there for so many years and now chairs the Energy Committee, of which I I started my career in the Senate on and a part of, and I'll come back to that also in a minute, but I wanted to say that they're a joy to work with, and for the Congresswoman that's here and former governor, um, thank you all so much for uh, including me uh, in this. I want to just begin, I know you've had many uh, wonderful speakers, and I'm really looking forward to the lunch uh, speech uh, myself, and then we'll be having to fly back. Uh, but I wanted to say that uh, Pete Domenici not only was a wonderful mentor uh, to me when I got to the Senate, uh, now almost 13 years ago, um, but we became very close friends. And one of the men that I most admired in the Senate, and I was thinking about why that might have been. Obviously, he has an extraordinary record that is one to admire and knowledgeable about so many subjects. And actually, we share many similar interests in budget and appropriation matters and, of course, energy. But when I really got down to it, I think it has a lot also to do with the fact that while we're from two different parts of the country, we are very much alike. And relationships in the Senate maybe aren't what they used to be, but David, we need to find a way to kind of get back to really recognizing that. And when it comes down to it, we're really just all human beings with, in some cases, if we would just think a minute, uh, with very common paths. Pete, as a father of eight, as you all know, I think one of his children is here. And I know Nancy is not with us today, but I'm one of nine. And from the same sort of big Catholic family, and now a mother of two, what I didn't realize about Pete until just today was that his family was in the grocery business, so was mine, Pete, which I don't think you even knew that my grandmother ran a little grocery store. That's why I think you and I got along so well talking about food and other things. Plus, we're both Italian. Uh, he didn't believe I was Italian, but my grandmother's name is Machika. My mother's name is Machika, so we had a little, you know, of, of that. But, you know, the values that come from being from a large family and a family rooted in hard work and a family rooted in not just the power of government but the power of faith and the spiritual aspects of the work that we do came across within my first couple of hours of meeting this man. And, you know, you have many people to meet when you get to be a senator. You've got, you know, a hundred of us um, plus hundreds, um, you know, on the floor of the House, 435 on the floor, so it's, it's a little overwhelming. But this man's spirit and his intellectual honesty and his heart, you know, stood out to me. And from that early time, I thought to myself, this is a guy you need to get to know and you need to follow and watch him. and. That's what I did, and it has been to my great benefit, and I hope to the country that we serve and to the states that we serve that some of the work that we've been able to do together has been 
been helpful. But I, I hope that you all know that while you've got wonderful senators and have in the past and presently, that I believe that Pete Domenici will go down um, in the ranks of American senators in this century among the very best. And you know the litany of what he has done and the breadth and the breadth of work, which is not just the amount and the volume, but the breadth of work, whether it's from nonproliferation and nuclear policy to energy policy to budget policy to technology to health and mental health. There are many senators, believe me, that spend lots of time in the Senate, and if they manage to get one major piece of legislation passed in a major area, it's big news because it takes huge amount of intellectual capacity and abil ability to build compromise and bridges. But as you will, will learn, as you probably already know, but as this uh, institute develops, um, you will come, I think, to more fully appreciate here in New Mexico the extraordinary impact uh, that this senator has had in a breadth of issues. I've been asked to speak today just about a few, um, mostly on energy and a little bit of the outlook for energy and the place that this um, senator has played um, in, that, uh, in that effort, and I'm, I'm proud to do so. And want to start with something, of course, that's close to both of our hearts and maybe something that you all don't know a lot about at this point, but it's going to become more and more and more of an issue. In fact, some local and international scholars call the issue of water the issue of the whole next century. You know, and David, you may be hearing this in the circles, and Chancellor, that you, it was oil in the last century, it's going to be water in the next century. Either you're going to have too little of it, you're going to have the wrong kind of it, or you're going to have too much of it. And I come from a place, and another thing we have in common is Pete was the mayor, of course, and so was my father, the mayor of New Orleans. So we grew up actually loving the cities that we came from and hoping for them better times and stronger economies. And so it was quite overwhelming four years ago for the city that I grew up in, and my father was mayor from 1970 to 78, to actually go underwater um, for all practical purposes, almost all of it, and regions around it where the city, 450,000 people and parishes around it that, uh, that, that uh, added to about 600,000, the area was almost 50 to 60 percent destroyed with water up to the rooftops in some places as high as the room that we're in today. It's an unbelievable visual, and I wish I had the pictures to show you, but those of you, I've got uh, friends here from Louisiana might would definitely remember, and all of us will remember, those scenes when the levees broke and Hurricane Katrina came through, the largest storm ever to hit the United States of America in mass and volume of water and speed of wind, and dumped uh, that water on the city. The reason I bring that up is because before that happened, uh, Pete Domenici knew it would. And there are very few men that have grown up or women in a desert that would be that smart to know <laughs> that this could happen along our coastal area. It takes great strength of character and leadership to know it, and he did. So for years on the Energy Committee, he and I passed a bill that probably doesn't get a lot of attention here, but I want you all to know about it because everyone in Louisiana knows about this bill and he's almost becoming a household word, which, Pete, you may not realize. But in almost every newspaper regularly now, they refer to this as the Domenici Landrieu Bill. And even though some senators from states like to reverse that and put their name first, in honor of Pete, I have not said a word, because it is true. It should be called the Domenici Landrieu Bill. And people in Louisiana refer to this reverently because what this bill does is establish for the first time in the history of our country a way for coastal communities, particularly in this particular case, the coast of Texas, 
which was just devastated last year. I'll be in Galveston next week to get an eye view of how Galveston is coming along, but it was, you know, it's been destroyed twice now in this century. It was just destroyed, um, almost destroyed completely just last year. I'll be there next week. But this particular bill, the Domenici Landrieu bill, established for the first time an opportunity for oil and gas producing states that produce oil for the country and produce gas for the country, which we desperately need. And New Mexico and Louisiana have a lot in common because we understand about natural resources. And Pete knew instinctively, Senator Domenici, how important this was to allow us to take a portion of those revenues to try to uh, reestablish, um, refurbish, restore our coastline, and build levees that won't break. So the million, two million people that live in South Louisiana and call it home. We have 4.5 million people in our state. About two and a half million live below I-10, within 75 miles of the coast. We're not on a beach because there is no beach in Louisiana. There's a beach in Florida. There's a beach in Texas. But we have this vast coastline that drains three quarters of the United States. Not New Mexico, but almost all the states to the east um, to the east of you all and all the way down Illinois and Chicago and from the, the northeast coast, two-thirds of the continent of the United States drains through that Mississippi River. And if you would remember how the map looks, and it gets down to that city of New Orleans where I'm from. And this country, because we didn't have enough leaders like Pete Domenici over the last hundred years, not enough, we had a few, and he was one of them, didn't realize that one day those levees would break, and one day, because we channeled the river in the wrong way, for good reasons, to do navigation, that those wetlands would erode so that a city that was founded 350 years ago inland, surrounded by miles and miles of wetlands, would now be exposed to the threats and risk of oceans and surges, et cetera. Why is this important? Because not only is this important to the United States to get this right for coastal communities that are not just condos and sunbathing and resort areas, but the coastal communities that run our ports so that the food delivered on this table today has a way to enter or exit or the economy generally running all the port cities. But think about the coast um, and the flooding potentially in Europe, and what happened to the Netherlands in 1953, and think about where Bangladesh sits today, and think about third world nations that have deltas just like we do, and communities that are absolutely naked to the forces of nature. Where is the technology to be able to know how to save these deltas? Where is the funding that is going to support helping people? to stay in the homes in which they were born with smart policies to help them to live in coastal areas all over. Well, you have the senator that helped me to lead that fight. I don't know if the time he was doing it, he or I realized how big of what we did is, but we got 37.5% of these revenues from offshore, which will equate, Pete, we hope, to about a billion dollars a year. That money will come in to Louisiana, Texas, Alabama, and Mississippi, and help us develop some of the cutting edge technologies and new kinds of plans to help us prevent the kind of flooding that happened when you saw people drowning in their homes or trying to swim desperately out of water that was over their head, and the kinds of technologies not only that will protect, but will also ensure great energy development and navigation. There are not many models in the world, and I travel to the Netherlands twice now, and I'm going back this year because I've found, Pete, in the Netherlands a delta, one of the nine major deltas in the world that are similar to ours that you help with this funding. And now we're thinking about modeling an institute like Deltaurus, which is one of the finest water management institutes in the world, partly public, partly private, and create that in Louisiana. And your senator basically had everything to do with it, because as chairman of the Energy Committee, uh, he determined that it was high time for interior states like New Mexico to recognize that New Mexico and other interior states had been sharing these revenues. You all know you all have been doing that since 1927, that coastal states, too,
could continue to do that and secure a great coastal future. And in that, and the connection to energy, not just good public policy, is that we can continue to mine and look for the oil and gas off of our shores that are so important. And I wanted to mention to you, Senator um, Domenici, and to all of you, some new information that it's really not roundly published, but sometimes we as senators get very good uh, primary briefings uh, in Congress. I had a group of business leaders come in, energy leaders, uh, just two weeks ago, and said that the new discoveries that they're making onshore in the United States is quadrupling the projections of natural gas in this country. So the projections for onshore gas and offshore gas and deep water oil are increasing. That has got to be good news to the American people and to all of us, not only because of the jobs it produces, but when we think about energy security for America, I know the people in New Mexico think just like the people of Louisiana. Let's start at home <laughs> producing the energy that we need through oil and gas and also transitioning to more green fuels of the future, which is the second point that I want to make about this senator. Not only did he know what we should have done 100 years ago and help make it happen for this coastal restoration, but as chairman of the Energy Committee, he balanced his passion and mine for our traditional oil and gas sources that create jobs and can be a bridge to the new fuels of the future and kept investments in technology. Pete, as chair of the Senator Bing, as Senator um, Domenici is chair of the Appropriations Committee on Energy and Water. That is the committee that has almost virtually in the Senate complete control over the technology and the investments that made these findings possible. This just doesn't happen, everyone. This just doesn't happen because business is good. Business is wonderful, and, and business people, all of you, are in, in either public, public work or private work. I never underestimate the power of the private sector. But I can tell you as a senator, watching what this man did, quietly investing in technologies, the two technologies, Pete, that have made this happen is hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling. And some of those technologies were developed because of investments the federal government made as well as private industry in partnership. And that is also a significant legacy for this chairman, to recognize the importance of federal and public and private partnerships, to invest early before anybody really you know, knows what could potentially happen, and then have something like this come out where the United States is now has four times more capacity in natural gas. That helps every manufacturer, every business. And if we can just keep the public policy moving along to encourage more drilling in these two areas, it would be a tremendous opportunity for our country. Considering we're now importing 70% of our oil when just a couple of decades ago it was less than 40%, why are we sending our money to buy oil from places that do not have our best interest at heart, that don't share our values. Why are we making those countries rich when we could enrich ourselves? That was a message that Senator Domenici tried and continues to try, and I'm committed to help him uh, as, as we move forward. But to do this as he did in the Energy Committee and also keep his mind open to helping us reestablish a commitment to our nuclear industry, to help us open possibilities for wind and for solar, which this state can benefit so much, but to do it in a balanced way, that as we move to a greener grid, we want to support that domestic oil and gas uh, industry, of course, with our mind, on reducing carbon where we can. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, in the Senate today, there are only a handful of people that can stand in the center like that. You either have people that are totally against oil and gas and fossil fuels completely and want to eliminate them despite the fact that we're going to need them for the next foreseeable future, or you have uh, those on the other side um, 
you know, that want to just continue to produce in the old ways and not look to the opportunities of the future. Pete Domenici was a guy that taught us how to do both, and I'm proud to sort of be from that Domenici school of, uh, of, centrist, of centrist politics. So from, you know, the impact that he's had on uh, domestic drilling at home, uh, his investments in new technologies that have helped our nation move forward in terms of a stronger domestic uh, drilling program, not just understanding how the West works or how interior states work, but understanding the role that coastal states play in this. And then, you know, thirdly on energy, leading the charge to re-engage our country in nuclear energy. We produce 20 percent of our electricity from nuclear today. France produces, I think, about 80 percent. We have got to figure out a way with the increase in demand for electricity to produce electricity in an affordable and clean manner. Nuclear meets our climate objectives. It also can employ thousands of people, push our new technology out. And that work was almost single-handedly done by Senator Domenici. I can point to the other things that I've talked about. We all, not all, but some of us, a group of us, kind of made happen. But the resurgence of the commercial nuclear industry in this country and the work that's being done now in Washington literally came from Pete Domenici's office. And the people of New Mexico need to know this will have such far-reaching positive impacts as we struggle to produce the electricity that this nation needs. And you can only get it either from oil, from gas, from solar, from wind, geothermal, or nuclear. We've got to get more of it really quickly, and the, and the more that we can get that meets our climate objectives, the better. He was one of the lead voices and great teachers uh, on this subject. And I'll conclude and maybe open up with questions if we have some time with this thought as well. The things that I've mentioned in terms of energy, it is central to America's national security. Right now, we're getting too much of our energy offshore. We're borrowing too much money from other people. We're not investing and using the technology that we have here. And if we don't reverse some significant courses here, our country that led in so many ways in this last century will really be fighting to hold our economic position and our national security. And it is a national security issue to provide Americans with reliable, affordable energy that can meet our, you know, uh, uh, targets for our environment, create jobs, press the envelope for technology, and in my case, particularly the case of the people of Louisiana, do all of this and provide the billions of dollars that the coastal communities need to secure these ener this energy infrastructure build the levees that won't fail, restore our coast, and give the 60 percent of the people that live in America within 50 miles of a coastline hope that we are developing plans that can help them make smart choices to develop sustainable communities that support the great work of this nation. So I could go on, but I won't because his legacy would take us, if some of us tried to talk about it, hours. But I wanted to share just a few thoughts about the impact that he's had on energy policy in this nation, why that is so important to our nat national security, and what a great deal of gratitude we owe to this senator and to you, the people of New Mexico, for sending such an extraordinary senator to us and for letting us have him for so long. And for his family of eight children, and I don't know how many grandchildren, and for Nancy, who sacrificed a great deal as well to allow him to serve. We're very grateful to the Domenici family. God bless you all. And the students get the first questions, and I'm sure they'll be the hardest. So let's go ahead and get them over with. They always are. Hi, Senator. Um, my name is Casey O'Neill. I'm an undergrad here. And 
we've had a lot of nuclear energy discussions over the course of this conference, and you bring to the table more issues. And so how do we further develop our nuclear energy capabilities, but keeping our national security interests in mind, and then, as, as other countries do so, uh, move toward disarmament in the Middle East? I'm sorry, and what the Middle as, East? As other countries move toward nuclear power as well, how do we like, move toward disarmament in the, in the Middle East? Well, that's a very good question, and of course there are two sort of separate issues related to nuclear. One is the nuclear weapons program, which, you know, your senator was also a lead. We refer to it commonly as non-Luger, but it could be non-Luger Domenici because they thought of it and he funded it. And if he wouldn't have funded it every year, we wouldn't be in the position we are when the Soviet Union collapsed. Now, this is before 9-11, of course, way before, and this is before people understood about non-terrorist states. This is before the word terrorist was even really known to that many people in the country. Your senator was quietly but effectively leading an effort to help dismantle nuclear weapons uh, that were held by former enemies states that were collapsing to make sure that nuclear material couldn't get into the hands of rogue states or nations or terrorists. That still is a great concern today, but it is much less of a concern because Pete Domenici lived and served. Because if he and a handful of senators and leaders hadn't focused on that, we would really, really be worried about that today. It's still a worry, it's still a risk, and I'm sure this risk is classified. Um, but we don't s lose sleep over it because of that happening. The other issue is commercial development of nuclear power. We, um, some projections are that we need to build 35 new nuclear plants. I think, Pete, is it, am I correct, 35 in the next 20 years or so to sustain our level of, of producing electricity. I mean, electricity has to come from somewhere, and there's some exciting places that it can come from, but it has traditionally come from oil and from gas and 20% nuclear, but it's shut down. We shut our own industry down. We were the leaders in the world. Now we're followers, but we're, because of Senator Domenici and some of the work that we're doing, we're trying to push through new technologies on nuclear, new ways to build nuclear power plants and figure out ways to get that waste uh, either stored or recycled so it doesn't itself become um, a, a danger to us and produce clean um, electric power. And let me just give you a quote that, uh, if I can find it, I think is really helpful. To run one coal-fired plant, which is where we get most of our electricity, and Y'all don't have, do you have too much coal here, Pete, in New Mexico, and a little bit of coal here? So you're a coal state, and we've been supportive. I, you know, import a lot of coal from other, we have a little bit of coal in Louisiana. We use a lot of it. But the problem with it is, is that it's dirty, uh, and we've got to figure out how to clean it. And it takes an awful lot of trains and trucks to move it. I think one coal-fired plant, if I can find this, takes one 1,000 megawatt coal plant is fed by a 110 coal car train arriving every day, okay? But think about a train, think about 110 cars, think about them all filled with coal. To furnace one coal-fired plant, that train has to get there every day. In a nuclear reactor that could be sitting out somewhere safely, redesigned, it takes a single tractor trailer once every 18 months. So the impacts of what our energy choices, what choices we make for where we get our energy have significant impacts on how many railroads we have to have, how many trains we need, how many highways we need, and so it's all factored in, and that's why this breakthrough, if we can get it on nuclear, is so significant. And on the Mideast, finally, it is a great concern uh, that Iran could soon be a nuclear power, and we are working very, very hard. In fact, I'm leading an effort, uh, Senator, with Senator Bai to sanction any uh, sanction Iran through preventing 
uh, the sale or the import to Iran of any refined petroleum products because while they have a lot of oil that they export, they don't have any refining capacity. And if we help shut down or try to shut down their refining capacity, it could put sanctions, it will put sanctions and will put potentially pressure enough to help them to change. It's extremely frightening to the stability of this whole world and we've got to do everything we can uh, to keep them from becoming a nuclear power. But excellent question. Thank you, Senator. My name is Miguel Lozano. I'm also an undergrad here. I was uh, curious with the, uh, the democratically controlled Congress, they've made it fairly clear that environmental safety and security is a priority with the CARS program, the American uh, uh, Energy Security Act. Um, and I was wondering if at this point if they set a precedent for the next Congress and future Congresses to make environmental safety and security a national security matter, a matter that is always going to be on the forefront. Um, do you think, do you see that happening or if, if a control of Congress has changed, will that, will that change? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, yes, Democrats have, with the win of the election and with President Obama uh, winning, has raised this priority higher than when a Republican was the president or when the Republicans were in control of Congress. But interestingly, many Republicans are also getting very concerned and interested um, in this issue. And, and some Democrats are even getting more interested. And there's a consensus building that this environmental issue is very serious. I mean, global warming is real. The you know, rising tides are uh, real now you all will be maybe one of the last communities flooded but we will be the first so maybe y'all have a little bit more time you know than we do to work on it but like that's why I do my work in South Louisiana because we'll be, being that we're under sea level below sea level right now we don't have a whole lot of uh, wiggle room here um, but I hope that we can find a balance because in this particular economic recession that we're in, while I'm all for pushing forward on green technologies and believe that and believe that we can really lead the world and create great opportunities, um, we, all, we can't do it at the expense of the economy right now. And while we need to push forward, I think we need to find that balance. And that's why after, if we ever survive this health care debate, and get on the other side of it, which I don't know if we will or not, I hope we do, when we take up this energy and environmental bill. It's always contentious, as the Senator knows, because he's helped to lead everyone we've had in the last you know, 20 years. But this cap and trade um, suggestion is a very different way of operating, and it's going to be a very contentious debate. Any more students? And then if not, we'll get in the back. Yes, sir. I heard you speak about the, uh, the oil and the gas industry and also about nuclear. What plan does the, does the government have to deal with the, the stumbling blocks that have traditionally been in place since the 70s or even the 60s with the environmentalists and the EPA constantly stopping production? Are you streamlining the amount of time it's going to take to get a nuclear plant in operation? Are you streamlining? the amount of time that it's going to take for people to drill and explore for oil? Yes, all and of the above. How are and, you doing that? Well, it started under the previous administration and they made, we made some headway and I'm hoping we can continue that. Now, this administration has um, positioned itself initially at a crossroads with that objective by suggesting um, the repeal of, of tax incentives that I personally believe are uh, important to the industry to sustain, um, and I'm at odds with the administration over that. I think that position is not helpful to trying to uh, make more robust the industry. But in the previous administration, there were some permitting streamlined process, access to public lands. The bill that we passed, I failed to say, and I thank you, not only did it share the revenues, it opened up 8 million new acres of oil and gas to drill. It was one of the largest acreages opened by our bill. So it did two things. It established revenue sharing and opened up acreage, uh, which was a, a breakthrough, in, the first breakthrough in 20 years because of the moratoria off the coast. 
You also realize a major breakthrough happened right after that when the whole moratoria was lifted. It, there used to be a moratoria around all the coastal areas of the United States. That's how much this issue has changed in the public's mind. The public is saying, I think, we'll drill. We may not want to drill in every inch of every square of every coast or in every state, but let's be smarter. Let's go drill where the oil and gas is. Let's minimize our footprint. And when it comes to nuclear, we've created a loan program for the industry, which Secretary Chu is processing right now and expediting. So we're on the verge. I know it's been a long time coming, but yes, President Bush made some headway. And Democrats in Congress, uh, particularly led by Senator Bingaman right now, is trying to push some of that forward. So thank you for your question. Yeah. Senator, Governor. Uh, there was a lot of complaints after the hurricane hit New Orleans about the collaboration between state, local, federal government, the, the operation of FEMA. And, and so there have been those kind of complaints around for a long time. And efforts were supposed to be taken to make sure that didn't happen again. Are you comfortable now, after all of these now years have passed, that we would be prepared if another hurricane? I'm hit sorry your to city? say the answer is no. I'm not comfortable, and the country is not prepared. And it's just as simple as that. Um, I have, besides being on the Energy Committee, the distinct, I guess, pleasure of serving as the subcommittee chair for the subcommittee on Homeland Security that is overseeing or trying to oversee our disaster preparation and response. And the long and short of it is that the federal government was wholly unprepared for what happened in Katrina. The scale of this disaster was 10 times more than has happened in Hurricane Andrew or in the Northridge earthquakes or anything. And so what happened was they had a plan to distribute some water, get a few MREs out, hook a few trailers up, but when a whole city is emptied, a whole metropolitan area is vacated for six months to 18 months. I mean, literally, people were told to leave and did. Lots of people, of course, had to, had to be saved to get out, but then people couldn't come back for six months. Can you imagine somebody, like on Monday, just waking up and saying to this city, everybody just leave, and y'all come back in six months? I mean, that's sort of how New Orleans had to operate. There was no loan program in place for a city to maintain its infrastructure. I could go on and on. So the answer is it's a work in progress. And we're working as hard and as fast as we can to make sure that if this happens again, we have a better plan in place. But it is not there yet. And it's going to take smart work, and it's going to take collaboration. The good news is that in Louisiana, at the state and local and federal level, we're getting better and better working together. And the, the Senate has been very generous. The House has been generous. This president, I think, will be very generous with helping us. But you know, Lord help us if a major earthquake hits Memphis, Tennessee, or if an earthquake hits out in California, or a tsunami hits Seattle, or Hurricane 5 hits Long Island like it did in 1938. We are not prepared. Not how to evacuate, how to communicate. All cell phone lines went down. There was no communication. So even if you had an evacuation plan, nobody knew it because you couldn't communicate. And it is a big risk for our nation. And I think Katrina raised some very troubling issues. We're still working on it, but um, hopefully we'll stay on point and get it done. But thank you all. Y'all have been very gracious. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you all so much. The proceeding was a production of New Mexico State University. The views and opinions in this program are those of the author and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the NMSU Board of Regents.